procedures that hide what's going on in court and exclude us from the process, a necessary healing of holding ourselves to account and the risk that if we are true in their courts, that instead of it being a form of healing and a form of uh, repairing what goes on, that the courts instead will take advantage of our honour and throw away the key. My issue is the perversion of the law. And I hope it is yours as well. So some people have written to me, and, and I know that this is a question that people have a number of times where they say, and by the way, I've had people write to me and say, um, what happens if I don't follow your rules? I want to follow them now, but I, I don't want to follow them tomorrow. It, the law is the law, no matter what society you're in. If a society doesn't have laws and it's not prepared to, to protect those laws, then really it can't be considered a society. And if you don't wish to subscribe to a clarity of law, and if you don't wish to subscribe to the logic and the sense, then read the law which is there openly in Eucadia, then then maybe you're not ready for Eucadia. But at the end of the day, with our laws and with what we're doing, we seek in everything we do to hold ourselves to a higher standard so that we can be the mirror in their system. Not destroyers, but healers. Not destroyers, but creators. We're not here to, to hurt anyone, but we are certainly here to clean up the mess. This world cannot continue in the way it is. Well, let's talk about then, about the important updates to the executive letter and the important insights of the research we have been doing. And one of the things that we have discussed when we go back to the time of Henry VIII and the creation of the common law system, and it's been a criticism that has been raised several times from a number of, of groups where they say this emphasis on Sester KV. Well, Sester KV is just a label. In parts of the system, they use the words Fides Commissary Trust. And you'll hear those words, Fides Commissary Trust, being used. And a number of people talk about that being the type of trust. And another one you'll hear is the words Foreign Citus Trust being used. It all sounds nefarious and all sounds a bit, bit wonky. Well, whatever label you use, we're talking about the same thing. So whether we say Sesta KV, Fides Commissary, or Foreign Citus, we're talking about the same things. The name really depends on, on, on the looking glass of what you're looking at. Another, another issue that people have had is getting their heads around how many trusts there are, what form of law created them, the fact that they exist at all, and how and the proof that these things, in fact, the proof that these things were created. Well, we mentioned 1540 as the first example of the creation of Sesta KV. But in actual fact, there was earlier laws created under Henry VIII that laid out the concepts, the concepts of property that are then used for the other types of trusts. So, for example, in 1533, we find that the ecclesiastical statutes created by Henry VIII that defined the notary, notorial procedure, ecclesiastical property is the foundation of the CQV concept of ecclesiastical trust and ecclesiastical property, which is the third CQV they create to us, where the state actually performs the ritual of baptism on us. Because under the ecclesiastical statutes, we find definitions of marriage being ecclesiastical property and baptism being ecclesiastical property. Very important. 
1535, we, we see the creation of the statute of uses. And of course, the word uses often gets mistaken and, and misunderstood because we're not taught the meaning of property. Property is right of use, uses. So statutes of uses is the creation of personal property and the concepts around personal property. And the second CQV they create when they monetize the birth record that our parents sign. So what we find from the very beginning, something that we haven't embedded and made clear enough to, to all of you, is that the evidence, the hard evidence exists without embellishment and without overinterpretation. The evidence exists that is an absolute fact that from the very beginning they knew they were going to create three trusts one holding your name one holding your birth and flesh and one holding your spiritual property from the get-go and that these acts and how they evolved have been there from the beginning now what is also apparent and we have a lot more work to do on this, is that they knew that with any law, the implementation of a series of trusts without any kind of remedy would make it unlawful. So they did provide remedy in different acts that followed from that that we have not yet, as I say, fully investigated, but we are, and I'm letting you know that we are working on this, and I'll give an example. When it comes to the Sesta KV, the, the one that is created on your name, well, you've probably heard that, that when you're married, you change your name. When that happens, a new trust is created. In fact, there is a right. You can go to birth, deaths and marriages and, and through a deed poll, <laughs> a deed poll, you can change your name lawfully. Well, what's the mechanics of what happens when you change your name by deed poll? Well, first off, you, you uh, apply, you create uh, the request. When the request is, is uh, processed, because it is your right, that CQV is collapsed. Normally, because you've appointed the authorities as the executor, they then are granted the right from that moment, whether it be seven days or 14 days of probate. The probate is when the property of that trust uh, is, is held over until a new trust is created, the, the new name. So there is an example specific to the first Sester KV that has been hidden in plain sight that shows the system would claim that by being able to change your name, although they would not admit that it's a trust, that there is a form of remedy for us if we were not satisfied with the straw man that they use against us. Well, what about the second Sester KB, the one that they use to create their bonds, to create currencies, that the whole entire global banking system runs on. Well, in 1542, we see the creation of remedy. And in fact, and we probably wouldn't realize this, the first appearance of the word bank. I urge any of you to go back and look at the definition of bank. What you'll find is you, if you really want to get to it, they say that it's a bench, it's a seat, Latin bankers, they say it's old high German, they say it's um, Danish. But ultimately what you find is that the roads leading to the true etymology and origin of the word bank go cold pretty quickly. But in 1542, under the Henry VIII Venetian, and I know people find this difficult to believe, but Jesuit partnership, we see the bankruptcy statutes being created. Bankruptcy. So the word bank 
and the word ruptus, which amongst other things means annulment. Well, bank, just to cut to the chase, is a word that we believe, strongly believe, was created not from Latin or from the Danish tongue or from Old High German or from Old English, but from two Egyptian words, bar, meaning soul, person, spirit, and ank, or ank, usually written as A-N-K or A-N-K with an H, the H being silent binding, Phoenician word, Phoenician H being silent binding. So it's true sense, the H is redundant. It's just written there as a diversion. But A-N-K, the ank, the ank. And the ank is famous as a symbol of immortal life, the symbol of uh, Isis, and in the Roman system, it was a symbol of Venus and a symbol of Luciferia, or Lucifer, if we don't see the feminine. So when we combine Bar and Ankh together, what we get is the spirit or the soul of Isis, Venus, the mortal life, or Lucifer, Luciferia. Now, of course, people say that's pulling in a bit, stretching in a bit. But in everything we see, <clears throat> there are multiple layers. And certainly there are multiple layers in the meaning of the word bank. A long bench, a place of judgment, seat, an altar. Now, we've already revealed that every single court action is the sacrament of penance. We've also revealed that every negotiable instrument whether it be a Federal Reserve note, promissory note, certificate, anything in order, is an indulgence. So it makes sense that the bench on which they do their business is also an altar. And it makes sense that there is a connection to some higher spirit that they're claiming. Bar Ankh is the origin, we believe, of the word bank. So in bankruptcy, we see built into the system from the very beginning, virtually, and to the present day, the ability to collapse the second Sester KV trust, albeit they don't admit that it's a trust, they don't admit the deeper assets written against it, but there it is. Now, of course, socially, the concept of bankruptcy is considered abhorrent, and in many, many fields and professions, if one has uh, undergone bankruptcy, they are prevented from working, many fields. However, it is evidence that in the system there is remedy and there is, of course, evidence that they do collapse these trusts because one of the concerns that many of you have had particularly in the last few weeks, is the EDP process has changed. Does that mean that there'll be more changes? Is this kind of like an endless chasing the tail? Is there no remedy at all in this process? Are we just looking at, I guess, you know, a road to nowhere? Is there any proof that the system ever collapses any trust. Well, yes, there is. I've just given you two. Change of name and bankruptcy. We have more to do and we have more to, to see and how this knowledge can be utilised. But we're far from wrong. And the work that many of you have done in producing your ecclesiastical deeds and claim of right is certainly far from wrong. Now let's talk about the executive letter, which I've been saying we'll talk about in the relevance of this information. Under the sacrament of penance, it is now patently clear that the system is not permitted to drive it through without our consent. Our consent may be tacit, 